Hello, and welcome to our Art and Architecture webinar series. I'm Kurt Camello, the Curator of Fine Art and American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I have the pleasure of being your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical society in the world. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Noted author Adrian Tenniswood tells us that rock and roll and stately homes go together like Rolls Royces and swimming pools. But the idea that stars should celebrate their professional success by buying a country house is nothing new. Today, Adrian will show us how film and rock stars embrace the life of the landed gentry in the decades after the Second World War, when swinging London collided with aristocratic values and the ancient ways of the country house. Their story is chronicled in Adrian's 2021 book, Noble Ambitions, The Fall and Rise of the Post-War Country House, which details how dukes and duchesses desperately clung to their ancestral seats as a new class of homeowners brought their wild ways into these crumbling halls of power. From Mick Jagger dancing at Deb Balls to the Sixth Marquis of Bath selling a village and buying some lions, Asia will reveal some of the juicy spits of post-war aristocratic history. Aristocratic history. <laughs> if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many of them we can at the end. I also want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to yours with various limitations and distractions, not the least of which is me getting over a cold. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and thank you for your patience. And even if we do lose connection, you will always have an access to our recording on our YouTube channel that you can watch at any time. I would like to thank the Joseph and Robert Cornell Memorial Foundation for their generous sponsorship of the Art and Architecture webinar series, webinar series, specifically Melissa Young, a trustee who helped guide their support to the foundation. Adrian Tenniswood is the author of 16 books on social and architectural history, including Behind the Throne, A Domestic History of the Royal Household, The Long Weekend, Life in the English Country House Between the Wars, and His Invention So Fertile, A Life of Christopher Wren. Adrian is a senior research fellow in the history in history at the University of Buckingham and a visiting fellow in heritage and history at Bath Spa University. Please join me in welcoming the delightful Adrian Tenniswood. Thank you, Kurt. It's great to be with everybody. And I'm starting off, embarrassingly, I'm starting off with a shameless plug for my latest book. Many of the stories that I'm going to tell you can be found in more detail there. But that's enough of that. Let's move on. Because I want to talk about the losses. And there were lots of losses. In the 1950s, the country house in Britain was in crisis. Bowood, on the left here, is seen shortly before the Marcus of Lansdowne demolished the whole house and just left the stables and, and one wing. He couldn't keep it up anymore. In the bottom right, you can see the most beautiful West Grinstead Park, which was built in 1806 by the great architect John Nash and was demolished in the 1960s. Top right is George Dance, the youngest Stratton Park, which was a, an exquisite neoclassical mansion that was demolished in 1960. Well, most of it was demolished in 1963. Um, the, the owner, Basher Baring, um, aptly named, replaced um, Stratton Park that kept the, or the portico, but replaced Stratton Park with a, a country house, which is oddly reminiscent of my high school. So times were bad. If we think for a moment about Chatsworth, if we can move on to look at Chatsworth. In 1955, you know, one stately home was being demolished every single week. And a lot of it was down to taxes. <clears throat> taxes were... Take it, we're at 80%. Death duties were at 80% in the 1950s. Chatsworth very nearly went to the, the English National Ch Trust. The 10th Duke of Devonshire, this Duke's father, died suddenly in 1950. He was only 55, and his death was a disaster. He'd transferred a large part of his assets to a trust. But when he died, 
the statutory period between the date of the gift and the owner's death still had 14 weeks left to run. That gap of just under 100 days meant that the entire estate was taxable at 80%. It meant that Eddie's son and heir, Andrew, seen here, the 11th Duke of Devonshire with his wife, Debo, looking fetching in a ball gown. I don't know why she's wearing a ball gown. Anyway, Andrew had to find a tax bill of £4.72 million. That's somewhere in the region of half a billion pounds in today's money. He didn't know what to do. And as he said famously, I don't know what to do, but I don't want to be the one to let it go. And that motive, I don't want to be the one to let it go, is something that permeates so much thinking about the country house in the 50s and 60s. For example, in the years immediately after the end of the Second World War, the Marquess of Bath, seen at Longleat here, um, actually it's not the Marquess, you can see the Marchioness, and I'll tell you why in a moment. The, um, the Marquess of Bath at Longleat, he had been um, charging people to go and see a geological site, the, 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 the Cheddar Caves on, on, on his estate. And he was charging them a shilling a time, and looking for ways to hang on to Longley House in the 1940s, he hit on the idea of opening Longley to the public as a commercial concern. I charged, he charged half a crown for adults, a shilling for children. You can see here, the <clears throat> in a carefully staged um, for, uh, publicity shop, mind, you can see the Marchioness of Bath sitting behind a desk and selling the first ticket to the first visitor while her oldest son, Lord Weymouth, tries to sell people guidebooks, and her younger son looks balefully out. Not, not altogether clued up on the idea of visitor experience, I think, and, and visitor management. It was an enormous event, and very soon afterwards, a series of country houses started to open up as commercial concerns. This is the Duke of Bedford at Woburn Abbey, Woburn Abbey opened to the public on Good Friday, 1955. It was a tremendous success. Um, thousands of people went away happy that first weekend. One person went away with the Duke's dog, which was never seen again. Um, he, he wrestled a bit with the idea of the public being in the state rooms at Woburn. He wanted them, he wanted, he wanted their money, but he was a little bit worried about their behavior. When he found that first weekend, he found a woman who had actually got a pair of scissors she was cutting a square out of the damask silk curtains, the drapes in the one of the staterooms, because she wanted to match it with her sofas at home. People weren't sort of people weren't quite acquainted with, with the needs of conservation, I don't think. But it was it was a fantastic success. Um, they the Duke of Bedford got thirty seven thousand visitors on a single bank holiday weekend. And why? I mean, it tapped into a, a voyeuristic desire to see how the ex-ruling class lived, maybe, a rage for self-improvement, and a need to escape after the austere years of the Second World War. But it wasn't enough. It, by 1959, six years after his father's death, the Duke of Bedford's trustees still owed three million pounds in death duties. They were trying to sell, they were trying to give Woburn to the National Trust. The National Trust wouldn't take it. And Bedford, the Duke of Bedford, would do anything to keep his house. I don't want to be the one to let it go. So he appeared on television doing the twist, as you can see here. He, uh, he hosted, famously in 1958, he hosted the Sixth World Naturist Congress at Woburn Abbey. That's well known. What is less well known is that he licensed a private filmmaker to use the event, the nudist convention, to make a soft porn movie called Nudist Paradise, which was billed as Britain's first full-length nudist film. You can see him here at the premiere and a publicity shot. Uh, I haven't managed to get hold of a copy of Nudist Paradise, but if anyone knows where they can find one, could you let me know? It's for research purposes only, of course. The Duke also, I say he would do anything, he would. I mean, he advertised dishwashers. His wife and daughters advertised cosmetic cream. Even so, this is a, a, an aerial view of Woburn. It's, it's what was left when, when the Duke of Bedford took over Woburn in the early 50s. 
he found that there was dry rot everywhere. What you're seeing in this aerial view is roughly half of what was there. He had to pull down most of it. But it's not all gloom, not by a long way. For one thing, new country houses were being built. On the top right here, you've got King's Waldenbury, which was built in 1971 by the, the gifted architect Raymond Erith. In the bottom right, you've got the Duke of Westminster's Eaton Hall, built in 1973. It didn't last very long. It was taken down in 10 years later. But it's an interesting example of a modernist stately home, which is what it was. And you've got people buying country houses and remodeling them. The, the image on the left shows um, a drawing room at Britwell Salome in Oxfordshire, which was bought by David Hicks, the designer, and his wife, Lady Pamela Mountbatten. And they remodeled it, they refitted it, they redecorated it. Uh, the, the story is that David Hicks was very keen in the late 60s and 70s on, on dark browns in his, his interiors. And the story is he came across the idea because he and Pamela, who had they had Pamela Mountbatten and David Hicks had quite a stormy relationship. And the story is that one day they were having a fight and um, Pamela threw a bottle of Coca-Cola at her husband's head. It missed, but it smashed on the wall behind him here. And he turned around, he looked at the, co the Coca-Cola dripping down the wall and thought, that's a good colour. I'm going to try that. And a design ethos was born. We forget, I think, that... As houses went on the market, which they did in increasing numbers, stately homes went on the market in increasing numbers in the 50s and 60s, they were bought. It was happening in the 20s and 30s. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a, was one example. There's a, a, new, a new generation of movie stars and directors took advantage of the collapsing pro property market to acquire houses in the country. This is Hills House in the pretty Buckinghamshire village of Denham where the director, Alexander Corder, who um, made famously made um, Private Lives of Henry VIII with Charles Lawton, and his wife, Merle Oberon, they, they bought Hill House and lived there until the divorce in the 1940s, 1945. Um, then we have, because for a time, Buckinghamshire was a favourite haunt of some of Britain's biggest celebrities. It's because there were movie studios scattered around Buckinghamshire, just north of London. There was there was Pinewood. There was uh, there was Denham Studios. Alexander Corder's Denham Studios. There was Bora Wood. It wasn't a Hollywood, but it was the kind of the heart of the British movie industry. So Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee bought not the Abbey, um, a house built out of the ruins of a medieval Augustinian monastery, and lived there for sixteen years. I could not leave it alone," said Larry uh, Olivier. "I was a child lost in its history." When they came to sell it in 1960, Vivian Lee was distraught. She said, I walked from place to precious place. I gazed at the beloved views with tears pouring down my face. Others, though, were um, more into, well, I mean, you know, Larry Olivier is, is famous for his overacting, genius though he was. But um, pr pr privacy, prosperity, an element of theatrical myth-making come together in, in the, the houses owned by Dirk Bogard in the late 50s and early 60s. Dirk Bogard is a, a, an interesting a kind of case study, if you like, in, in myth-making and the country house and the movies. He was a gay man living with his partner, Tony Forward. Um, he certainly required privacy. Remember, in Britain at this time, you could go to jail for being gay. But although the circles that he moved and didn't care about his sexuality, Rank, the studio that um, he was contracted to, most certainly did. Nothing must mar the image of a handsome heterosexual heartthrob. They even manufactured a, a fictitious sexual relationship with a French movie star, Capuchin. And in the early 60s, Tony and his partner, um, sorry, Dirk and his partner, Tony, lived here at Drummer's Yard. They called it the Palace. And they lived on a grand scale. They hosted extravagant parties. Sylvia Sims, the movie actor, remembered a particularly star-studded occasion one Sunday when Bogart threw a party for Bogart threw a party for, for Judy Garland, seen here. Um, they were making a, a movie together. It was to be Judy's last film, in fact. I could go on singing. Noel Coward was there. Everybody gathered around the piano. Well, Judy Garland and Noel Coward sang duets. My goodness, can you imagine that? Incredible. 
the the writers Keith Hall, Keith Waterhouse, and Willis Hall also enjoyed a memorable Sunday at at Dirk Bogard's Palace. They went down one Sunday in um, the early nineteen sixties to discuss the possibility of making a movie together. They were writers and they wanted to talk to Bogard about the possibility of of making a movie. Um, they also thought that Capuchin, his his fictitious girlfriend, they thought that Capuchin might be there at the palace and they wanted to check a rumor that she was in fact a man. As you can see, she was not. Um, but Bogard's sec sexuality was no, no secret in the film world. However, the first hint that this wasn't going to be a conventional lunch party came as their chauffeur-driven car cruised up the drive to Bogard's country house, and they saw his partner, Tony, wearing an apron and walking up and down the lawn with a vacuum cleaner. He was hoovering the lawn. Once inside, Bogard was there to meet to welcome them, and Tony, arrived, Tony appeared without his apron and without his hoover to pour them champagne, then more champagne then more champagne, and there's no sign of lunch. There was no sign of the staff. Every now and then, Dirk Bogard would disappear into the nether regions of the house and they would hear shouting. Then he'd come back, charming and urbane as he always was in public, and offer them another drink. They moved into the dining room where the table was set, where champagne gave way to Chablis. There was still no sign of lunch. We moved on to a second bottle of Chablis, said, um, um, said Hall, and the elegant French clock on the dining room marble plate, marble chip mantelpiece ticked on towards 2.30. Suddenly, at last, the dining room door opened and Capuchin swept in carrying a large silver salver. She slammed it down on the table, swore at Bogard and walked out again. The four men looked at the salver for a moment. Then Bogard lifted the lid to reveal a mound of tinned spaghetti in, in tomato sauce. Cold tinned spaghetti in tomato sauce. They never did discover the story behind it. Every, no one mentioned the food. No one mentioned the service. Everyone simply carried on as if nothing unusual had happened. In fact, Keith Hall rem remembered, Willis Hall remembered asking for seconds. Then they got up from the table, they politely thanked their hosts, and they drunkenly got back in their chauffeur-driven car and went back to London. Nobody ever knew what was going on there. Buckinghamshire was popular as a location with the British film industry, as I've said, partly because it's in re easy reach of London, but mainly because Pinewood and Denham Studios were both there, and as I say, Boreham Wood next door. Denham Mount, this lovely, elegant Regency villa, um, which stood just outside Denham Studios, became the principal setting for David Lean's 1945 classic, Blythe Spirit. This was where Margaret Rutherford's Madame Arcati conducted the seance which disturbed the ghost of Charles Condamine's first wife, Alvira. Then we have um, Heatherden Hall, which was an opulent early 20th century country house in the grounds of Pinewood Studios. And this doubled as a country club for staff and a convenient location in any number of, of British comedy films in the 60s. Those magnificent men in their flying machines, Chitty Chitty, Bang Bang, Carry On at the Kyber, which you can see here. And at the same time, there's a whole genre of country house movies springing up in the 50s and 60s. They, they usually figure impoverished British aristocrats and wealthy Americans. A, a perfect combination. So Castle in the Air was a David Tomlinson movie about a, a Scottish laird who was struggling to keep his castle, his, his ancestral seat, and in fact had decided he'd rather sell it to an American tourist who came to visit, played by Barbara Kelly. Or you've got The Grass is Greener, which is a great, if you get the chance, this is a great movie. Cary Grant, Deborah Carr, and Robert Mitchum. Um, this is based at Osterley Park in Middlesex, just outside London, National Trust House. And the, the exterior shots were filmed at Osterley. The interiors were studio bound, but they were they were designed by Felix Harbord, a designer who deserves to be better known and who basically replicated the state rooms at Osterley. And you have the um, you have Cary Grant as the, the fifth Earl of Ryle. Um, being very English in some ways, although with a mid-Atlantic accent that wouldn't fool anybody on either side of the Atlantic, I don't think. We also find a new income stream 
arriving with the movies. The chap in the top right here is the Duke of Rutland. And in the 1960s, he rented Beaver Castle, that you can see there, uh, his ancestral seat, to a movie company to make an entirely forgettable film with Ira von Furstenberg called Matchless, a kind of sub-James Bond movie. Um, it wasn't a good movie, but it earned the Duke of Rutland £2,000 for 10 days filming. It was a huge sum in the 60s. And he was very canny. He said that 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 whenever they wanted to use a, an heirloom or a portrait or a, a, a piece of furniture, they wanted it in shot. He said, of course you can. That will be extra. He made a lot of money. Things didn't always go according to plan. Um, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford and Jerry Lewis bounced around the grounds of Eastmer Castle here on mopeds. Well, um, an increasingly easy uneasy owner, Major Benjamin Harvey Bathurst, um, looked, looked on, feeling that he probably hadn't charged them enough money because they trashed the place when they made this, again, a forgettable film called One More Time, directed by Jerry Lewis. You can see in the bottom right, uh, Sammy Davis, Peter, Peter Lawford, and um, uh, uh, Jerry Lewis sit sitting in the grounds of Eastner. Um, it didn't always go according to plan. Sometimes, sometimes the, 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 the film company took just a tiny advantage, maybe. But country house owners were always on the lookout for more opportunities to, ma to make money. Not because they were rich. Most of them weren't. They were desperate. Whatever they could do to bring in a few pounds, they would do. Famously, um, the Marcus of Bath at Longleat House, again, having opened his house to the public in the late 40s, in the late 60s, he went into partnership with Jimmy Chipperfield, who um, came from a circus family, to open Britain, in fact, Europe's first safari park. They brought in some lions. They got most of their lions because uh, Jimmy Chipperfield was telephoned one day by a film company in Nairobi, in Kenya, who said, we hear you on the lookout for lions. We've just been making a movie called Born Free, and we've got 10 lions spare. If you want them, 10 pounds each. And that was the start of the Longleat Safari Park, which is still going today. It's enormously successful. The... Another way in which country house owners sought to maximize, sought to, sought to generate income, was through music festivals. And these would become enormously significant events in, in, for the English stately home. This is a, a still of, of the punk singer Hazel O'Connor performing on a makeshift stage at Slane Castle in um, 1981. And then we've got um, the, the bucolic frolic at Nebworth Park, um, uh, which was um, first big, uh, the first um, Nebworth Park Festival was 74, I think, maybe a little bit earlier. And you can see here Van Morrison, those of you who follow these things, this is Van Morrison. This is Van Morrison when he had hair, even. We got the Doobie Brothers, we have, we have the Ullman Brothers Band. The, the, the bucolic frolic at Nebworth was a big event. And you know, country house estates were made for this kind of thing. They, uh, in the post-war years, they have their roots here at Bewley Palace House down in the New Forest in the south of England. In 1956, some jazz fans approached the owner of Bewley, Edward Montague, who had just opened his house to the public and who had also, um, he was labouring under a public relations disaster because he'd just gone to jail for, uh, he was convicted of homosexual practices. Uh, he was bisexual and he had been um, basically had been sold out by some some um, blackmailing uh, people who thought were his friends. Um, he'd gone to jail and he'd come out desperate to restore his reputation because in the 50s it was difficult. This He'd come out uh, in so many ways he'd come out. And in 56, these jazz fans say, come and put on a, a festival in front of Bewley, yeah, Bewley Palace House. Go put on a festival in the, in front of the lawn. And it did really well. They put on another festival the next year, another concert, and then another concert. By 1960, there were audiences of 10,000. Um, that year, anyone who was anybody in the British jazz scene was, was, was playing. Unfortunately, that was also the year when the BBC ran an outside broadcast. And when trad fans and modern jazz fans began to fight, and the whole thing turned into a riot, the BBC stopped their broadcast, 
uh, Lord Montague, who you can see here on the right, Lord Montague said it was a shame because otherwise they, they would have shown one of the most exciting outside broadcasts that the BBC had ever known. The press condemned the beatnik horror. They said the person who was to blame for the Bewley jazz riots was, of course, Jack Kerouac. <laughs> what? <laughs> Ridiculous. Jack Kerouac, that, who prefers to devote his talents to exalting the bums and jazz maniacs of the New York jazz, the New York jive sellers. Um, another person who was to blame was, of course, William Burroughs. Not because of his prodigious un um, intake of heroin, not for the fact that he had blown his wife's head off while they were stoned playing William Tell, but because, I quote, he lived for a year in a room in Tangier without taking a bath. These are the depths to which the beatniks will sink. The idea of a stately home as a setting for a music festival began to grow after Bewley. It began to grow in the early 60s. Um, at Longleat in May 1964, the Marcus of Bath um, put on a, a, a live concert with a band called J Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. They're a British band. They played in America quite a lot. They played, they, they toured with the Beatles. They were very popular in 1964. So popular, in fact, that when they started their cut their, their set, the stage was stormed by, by about a thousand screaming girls. Billy J and Lord Bath and the whole band had to run back inside Longleat House and barricade themselves in. As, as these girls kind of battered on the doors and the windows. Every now and then, um, a girl would faint and the Marcus of Bath's son-in-law and sons would, would, would rush outside, grab the poor unconscious girl, bring her into the great hall at Longleat, where the Marcus of Bath's daughter-in-law would try and revolt, re revive them with, with smelling salts. She said on one point, this girl just came round, on the, lying on the floor, she just ca came round from her faint she sat up, and at that point, Billy J. Kramer walked by, and she fainted again. After that, said Lord Bath's um, daughter-in-law, after that, I just gave up. But Lord Bath didn't give up. The, a couple of months later, he ran another concert at Longleat. This starred the Rolling Stones, who, for the younger members of my audience, were a popular musical combo. Um, here they are. You can see, when I say that, that they, they played at Longleat, this is Longleat House. This is the stage set up against Longleat, uh, against the house. It was an amazingly intimate affair. No huge screens, no massive amphitheatre. People just kind of sat around in front of the stage while the Stones played. There were, uh, the, the Marks of Bath said it wasn't too bad this time. There were only 200 casualties. In fact, there is a picture coming up now which I've only just discovered, um, uh, and and I wish I'd seen it in time to put in my book. This this picture is of this photograph is of the first aid station at Longleat at the at the Rolling Stones concert. These nurses are reviving you know, mainly young women, not into actually almost entirely young women who have fainted or collapsed. At, the, at just being near Mick Jagger was too much for them. These kind of things, these kind of concerts, um, again, were, were major revenue generators. In Woburn, at Woburn in 1967, there was a festival of the flower children when 25,000 hippies, complete with beads, bangles and bells, um, turned up. And there was a vast amount of publicity for the enterprising Duke of Bedford. Bedford, who would still do anything to bring Woburn to the, to the attention of the public. This kind of collision, if you like, between popular culture and tradition that shimmies through the whole of 1960s culture and country house culture in the 60s and early 70s. This, these pictures, these are two of my favourite pictures. This is a Vogue shoot of the Marquis of Londonderry at his ancestral seat of Wynyard in County Durham um, with his beautiful, beautiful wife, Nico. You can just see, if you can make him out there, you can just see the Marquis of Londonderry. There he is, thank you. You can, he's, you can just about see the fact that sitting resplendent in this beautiful drawing room, he's wearing dark glasses. Now that is, you know, that, that's just a, a kind of marker to show you how cool he is. But if you need another one, in the bottom left, in the foreground of this photograph, there is the Beatles' latest album with the Beatles. 
just to show his cool credentials. Nico exhibited her own cool credentials in rather different ways, in fact. She was obsessed with pop music, and she was also obsessed with pop musicians. She saw Georgie Fame, a big name in British pop music in the 60s. She saw Georgie Fame on a television programme. She invited him uh, and his band up to play at Winyards. And when they left, so did she. Um, she married Georgie Fame. She was divorced from her husband. This is the Marcus of Londonderry down in the bottom right there, looking bereft, partly because he'd lost his wife, but also because he just found out that his son and heir was actually um, fathered by Georgie Fame, um, who was dis disinherited, very, very tragic. It was a very tragic story, in fact. Nico eventually um, killed herself. She had committed suicide. Um, but Nico wasn't the only one to be taken with musicians. Um, when Gavin and Irene Astor moved into Heber Cost in 1964, the press noted that they got Foot, that the, their young daughters had foot high photographs of the Beatles on their bedroom doors. And let me show you this. This is this gives you an idea of how popular culture was permeating traditional landed society. This is a weekend party at Chatsworth. The Duke of Devonshire and the Duchess held a weekend party at Chatsworth in December 1963. And the Beatles were on television. And again, for my younger audience, the Beatles were also a popular musical combo. Um, they, they were on television and everything stopped on the Saturday night so that the, the Duke of Devonshire's house party could watch the Beatles on the telly. The septuagenarian Earl of Sefton, who you can see here in the bottom right, was heard to mutter as they sat in the drawing room watching the, the grainy pictures on the television, was heard to mutter, no one's accused me ever of being queer, but I do think that third boy from the left is rather fetching. Sadly, history doesn't record which Beatle he was talking about. I wish I knew. And while we're thinking about, about the attractions of young rock stars, Cecil Beaton, here in the top right, fell head over heels in love with Mick Jagger. And there are a series of clearly homoerotic photographs of, 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 um, of Mick taken by Cecil Beaton in the late 60s and 70s. Um, his passion was not requited. Although Mick did advise him to take LSD, he said, you're an artist, you'll, you'll, you'll like the colours. And again, history does not quite recall whether the Cecil Beaton took acid or not. We've got suddenly everybody wanting a Beatle or a Rolling Stone at their party. Uh, um, this is Lugala in the Wicklow Mountains in Ireland, uh, home to a Guinness heiress, uh, Una Oramore and Brown, who had fabulous parties here in the... Um, 1950s, Lord Kilbracken recalled how you would go to lunch at Lugala and you would emerge from the house three days later knowing you'd had a good time but not quite sure how or with whom. They were fabulous parties. And the tradition continued in the 60s. Tara Brown, um, uh, who was um, Una's eldest son and who is famous, uh, immortalised by the Beatles. Uh, I heard the news today, oh boy, about a, a lucky man who made the grade. Uh, Tara was killed in a car crash shortly after his 21st birthday. But his 21st birthday took place at Lugala. And in some ways, it's traditional. The estate workers are there. The, 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 the county set is there. Everybody you know, who's anybody in around Dublin comes to Tara's 21st party, birthday party. But so do his friends. And his friends are Mick Jagger, are Brian Jones, um, Paul McCartney couldn't make it because he's recording Abbey Road, but his brother, um, Mick McCartney, is there. The Gettys are there. It's a, a, And everybody is smashed. Everybody's stoned. Uh, Tara's favourite band at the time was called the, Lo the Loving Spoonful. Some of you may recall Loving Spoonful. They were a big band in the late 60s, John Sebastian, Summer in the City. Um, and he, uh, his mother hired them to play at the party. They turned up apparently completely in awe of this huge house in the middle of the in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, but they were met at the door by Tara, who gave each of them a pipe and a lump of hashish and said, "Just relax." And it was quite a wild party. The loving spoonful drummer remembered how the next day he'd um, he made love in a field to a girl he'd just met, and then we rode white horses and watched rainbows. Yeah, I bet you did, mate. Everybody wanted 
to be part of the new set. This is this is the Earl of Lichfield. This is the Queen's cousin. This is Patrick Lichfield, the Society photographer, seen in the top top left with Britt Eklund. Um, this this is the, that collision between tradition and swinging England, swinging London, is epitomised, I think, by the um, by Earl the Earl of Lichfield, who at weekends will go up to his country house, Shugborough. Uh, in Staffordshire, in the English Midlands, and he would play the early, he would be president of societies, he would open fates and that kind of thing. During the week, he's in Carnaby Street, he's whizzing around London in a mini or, or an Aston Martin or on a big motorbike. He's being, he, he's being swinging London. And everybody wanted a part of this action. Lord Montague got stoned with the stones. The Duke of Bedford took to wearing male suits and frilly shirts and declared, I want to be part of swinging England. I don't think he quite made it, judging from these photographs. We have also, at the same time, and part of the same thing, is rock stars and pop stars buying into the country house dream. Just as country house owners wanted to buy into swinging London, swinging England, so singers and performers wanted to buy into the country. They wanted to buy into the, the, the traditional landed estate. This is a beautiful Elizabethan house called Socknersh Manor, you can see in front of you. And um, as you'll recognize, I'm sure, the, the two men on either side are, are Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck. In 1962, those two singers bought Socknersh Manor between them to use as a party house. If those walls could talk, Lord knows what they would say. Um, and they only had the house for a couple of years. But they wanted somewhere that gave them respectability, which they didn't possess, um, and also a, a, so a sanctuary, if you like, an escape from the, the, the bright lights. Rock stars bought into the country house dream. At the end of the 60s, it seemed as though every member of Rock's aristocracy wanted a mansion of their own, a private playground where they could act out their fantasies. The image on the left so shows Mick Jagger and Keith Richard outside Keith's beautiful Redlands in Sussex, a moated timber-framed house which he bought in 1966. At one point, Keith took up archery, but he was so bad at it that he was constantly missing the target and losing his arrows in the moat. Now, you or I might get better at archery, not Keith. He bought a single-seater hovercraft, so he said, so I can zip straight across the lawn into the moat, pick up my arrows and skim back out again. A hovercraft, for heaven's sake. He and Mick are seen here on their way to a, a court appearance after the police looked for and found drugs in a raid at Redlands in 1967. The British media was more interested in the fact that the police, apart from finding heroin, found Marianne Faithful, uh, um, Mick's girlfriend at the time. She was in the house clad only in a fur coat. And according to legend, she obligingly showed the police that this was indeed all she was wearing. Mick himself bought the 19th century Stargroves uh, estate in 1970. This is in the top right. Uh, um, Bill Wyman bought Gedding Hall in 1968. I always wanted to live in a castle, he said. This isn't a castle, this is a lovely fragment of an Elizabethan country house, but still worth having. Not to be left out, the Beatles, who had all except Paul bought substantial houses in St George's Hill in London, began to look for even more substantial mansions. John and Yoko in 1969 bought Tittenhurst Park, which you can see in the background here in the, in the bottom right. Um, John and Yoko bought this beautiful early Georgian house. They lived there for a year or so. This is where, George, um, where John wrote Imagine. Um, it was also where he and Yoko uh, uh, indulged a rather heavy heroin habit they had, which was not so good. But Imagine, if you get a chance, take a look at, um, at the, the video of Imagine. It, it, it is exquisite. It's shot in Tittenhurst in the drawing room. John, you can see a still from it in the top right. John is playing his, his white piano. Yoko walks around in a white shift and a gold circlet, opening the shutters in the drawing room, and then sits down with John. And they look at, I don't even like Yoko no, or John Lennon very much, but they sit there and they look at each other and they are so much in love. It's astonishing. Tittenhurst was also the scene for the Beatles' last photo shoot. 11 days after they, um, John and Yoko bought the country house, 
Um, the beat was turned up for a photo shoot here. Uh, it was just as they were, just as they were um, breaking up. That picture on the right says it all, I think. There's Paul with a heavily pregnant Linda McCartney walking along with, with Ringo, uh, John and Yoko in the far background, and George, George Harrison, who just uh, is, is separate. He's apart from them. And George is, is he's about to leave the band, in fact. He's about to break up the Beatles uh, um, as we see this. Tragic, but a moment from history and a country house moment from history too. On the topic of photo shoots, there's a monograph to be written somewhere, I think, on historic buildings as a backdrop for pop promotions. The 17th century building called The Stand in Derbyshire um, was a backdrop for the Stones Beggar's Banquet promotions. Uh, the pictures on the right show Focal Harem, a band that you may have may have, or may not have heard of. Their classic uh, hit was White A Shade of Pale, and they made one of the very first pop videos of White A Shade of Pale at Whitley Court, this wonderful ruined country house um, in uh, Worcestershire in the English Midlands. They used that they intercut, if you see the video, it's interesting, they intercut scenes from the Vietnam War, because this is the time it was, scenes from the Vietnam War, footage from the Vietnam War, with the band wandering around this ruined country house. Back to the Beatles, though, because um, of all the Beatles, in fact, of, of all the, the rock stars of the late 60s and early 70s, the one that had the biggest country house was George Harrison. This is Friar Park. Uh, near Henley on Thames in Oxfordshire, uh, um, the biggest of all the rock star country houses. He bought it in 1969. It's an amazing place. Filled, there are underground grottos and lakes. There are elaborate Japanese gardens. It's an incredible spot. He lived there with his um, his wife Patty, um, who was being pursued by Eric Clapton at the time. She resisted Eric Clapton's um, advances until one day she came home, found that George's bedroom door was locked, her bedroom door was locked at Friar Park. She finally got in to discover George in bed with Ringo Starr's wife, Maureen. You need a chart here, don't you? This is complicated. Anyway, that drove her, so she said, that drove her into the arms of Eric Clapton. And Clapton had a country house of his own. Um, he bought her Wood Edge which you can see here, an Italianate villa that was said to have been designed by Lutyens, so it been Lutyens. Uh, it wasn't, but it was still a beautiful house. And here, Eric Clapton indulged his drug habit and did his best to seduce Patty Harrison, eventually succeeding. Uh, it was also here that George, I mean, George was great, and Eric were great friends. Uh, this was, it was on the terrace here that George composed Here Comes the Sun, a beautiful, beautiful, one of his greatest songs. Everybody wants to buy, buy a country house. Roger Daltrey of The Who bought Homehurst Manor in 1971, um, a lovely 16th, 17th century country house. He bought more land. He began to live the dream. He bought more land. He bought cattle. He bought a trout fishery. He bought more land. And the interesting thing about Daltrey and about so many of these, these characters is that he's still there. Bill Wyman is still at getting, um, getting House, getting Manor. Eric Clapton is still at Hurtwood, um, Hurtwood Edge. George Harrison's widow is still at Friar Park. They, these weren't tax dodges. They weren't just kind of somewhere to, to trash, somewhere to drive your white Rolls Royce into the swimming pool and then walk away. These people bought into the country house dream and kept dreaming. That's the interesting thing, I think. They didn't just cut this, these weren't sort of fly by night things. They they became part of the establishment, part of the landed gentry in so many ways. Let me just finish on a, 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 an intriguing note, if you like. This is this is Led Zeppelin, another popular musical combo. Um after an unhealthy dalliance with the works of Satanist Alistair Crowley, you can see him in the bottom right there, uh, Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page, who bought 
actually Alistair Crowley's house, Bolskin in the in the um, Boleskin in the in Scotland. Jimmy Page gave up that unhealthy interest in Alistair Crowley and became more and more interested in the great Victorian architect and designer, William Burgess. If you're in England, never mind England, go to Wales, forget England, go to Wales, go to Cardiff, Cardiff Castle and um, uh, Castor Cock, a little castle just outside Cardiff in Wales, are fabulously bizarre, extravagant uh, examples of William Burgess's work. Burgess was fabulous. But Cardiff Castle is the only house I know where, which has a, a, a library which uses the duck-billed platypus as a decorative motif. It's, it's crazy. It's insane. And yet it's wonderful. And Jimmy Page fell in love with the work of William Burgess. So much in love, in fact, that he bought Tower House, William Burgess's home in Holland Park in London. He outbid David Bowie, who also wanted it. The previous owner was the actor Richard Harris, who had outbid Liberace, because he wanted to live there. John Betjeman, the British poet who lived there in the early 60s, talked of being awed into silence by its weird beauty. Jimmy Page wasn't awed into silence. He got down to the serious business of collecting Burgess furniture. And he is now, here he is um, with his partner, um, recreating Burgess's interiors at Tower House, and he is a leading collector. I mean, he's one of the world's great collectors of Burgess furniture. He's again, he's become from being the rock rebel. He's become a discerning connoisseur. He's bought into the dream. Let me end though, on my favorite country house meets rock and roll picture. Keith Richards sitting outside the smoking ruins of his country house. Keith, bless him. Keith had a habit of dozing off with a cigarette in his hand, and his houses did tend to catch fire quite a lot. But as he sits amid the debris and detritus of, a, of, a, of Redlands, you have to ask, you know, is there a serious point? Is there a serious point behind all this frothy rock and roll trivia that I get so excited about? The obvious point is that we constantly need to challenge our assumptions about the image of the country house. It doesn't, it's not Downton Abbey. It's so many other things. The other, the other serious point is that we need to challenge our assumptions about the country house in crisis. Our assumptions that the original owner is the best person to look after a stately home. The country house is in a constant state of flux. It has a multiplicity of meanings, breathing new life into it all the time. People buy country houses. People sell them, they give them up, and people buy them. They love them, they cherish them, they think they're precious just as much as, as, as ancestral owners do. There's no need for us to have a 19th nervous breakdown over it. There's no need to say it's all over now when it comes to the country house, because it isn't. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodness gracious, me six live. I don't think I've enjoyed the presentation more. I certainly haven't laughed more. Thank you, Adrian, so much for that. Um, before we get to your questions, and I also want to say as an aside, that in the follow-up email that all of you will be receiving, there will be a link um, where you can buy Adrian's book on Amazon should you be interested. Um, but before we get to all that, I'd like to go over some programs that we have coming up. On January 26th, I will be hosting Classical Shindig, Amateur Artistry from Two New Orleans Gentlemen. This is, um, these are two friends of mine who have put into a luscious book one year's worth of entertaining in their incredible early 19th century house in New Orleans. And then on February 9th, um, dovetailing very nicely with what Adrian has just told us, um, I'll be hosting Ben Cowell, who is the executive director of the Historic Houses Association, and he'll be giving a lecture that celebrates the 50th anniversary of the founding of this organization entitled The Revival of the British Country House. Not to be missed. Not to be missed, Kurt. <laughs> and you shouldn't, I mean, for those of you who hadn't picked up on this by now, the 1970s was pivotal, and that's when the, the um, Historic Houses Association was formed. Um, everything came together, the beginning of the realization that this, these things were being lost, and what Ben is going to do in this lecture is look back over 50 years and show us all how much has been saved and how bright the future is in spite of all kinds of, of challenges. And then for those of you who are not able to join us next week in New York City, 
for our annual Decamela Rendezvous, um, where I'll be talking on a lecture I've just finished called American Versailles, Philadelphia's Linwood Hall. We'll be giving an online version of that on February 23rd at 4 p.m. Now, let's go ahead to your questions. Type in as many of them as you like in the query panel, and we will answer as many as we can based on time we've got left. I'm going to start off with the question that a lot of people are asking, um, Adrian, why were death duties so high in the 1950s, 60s, actually in 70s and 80s as well? Well, they, I mean, they started off, like all taxes, they started off low. Uh, they started <laughs> in 1894, and they're a couple of percent. And people are saying this is the end of civilization as we know it. By the 1930s, you're looking at 40% on estates valued at more than £2 million, so the biggest estates. Then... In 1945, we have a, a, a socialist government, a Labour government, come in. And their intent, one on rebuilding Britain after the, 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 the chaos and the disaster of the Second World War, but they also have a social programme. And that programme is to squeeze the rich, if you like. And so death duties go up from 65% in 1946, I think, to 75% to 80% in 1950. And part of it is a, is a sense, it's not even the socialist government, because the conservative government feel the same thing. They say, these places have had their day. They're over. You know, the social function of the country house, even, you know, the, the conservative prime minister, um, Harold Macmillan, said these places have gone. You know, it's not for the state to save them if they can't make it let them go. And, well, we can tax them. You know, let's get the most we can out of them. So it's a political, it's an ideological point, but it's also a sign of the times, I think, that, that you know, whereas um, in the 40s and 50s, you've got stately homeowners who are lobbying for tax breaks. It's a bad time to do that because people are saying, you know, you live in Blenheim or Woburn or Chatsworth and you... You want a tax break. Well, there are people who haven't got homes. <laughs> you know, it's a very difficult thing. But it, it clearly, um, there was a, 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 a report, the Gow's report in 1950, which I'm sure Ben will be talking about um, when he when he um, gives his lecture. The Gow's report, a, a government committee was set up in 1950 by a Labour government, socialist government, to look at the crisis in the country house. Um, they said, you know, that, that taxation was killing the country house. And that unless there were tax breaks, there would be no more country houses. The interesting thing for me, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a very long answer to an excellent question. The, the interesting thing for me is that you have an assumption in the 40s and 50s, you also have it today, but in the 40s and 50s and 60s, that the best people to look after a country house, a stately home, are the, is the family that owns it, that, that have lived in it forever. In fact, that's a rather dodgy assumption. Um, a lot of owners of country houses, if you paid them, they'd be off to the south of France with their mistress as quick as they possibly could, you know? <laughs> They've got no attachment to these places. Some had. Like, I you know, that, that heart-rending quote from the 11th Duke of Devonshire, I don't want to be the one to let it go. I mean, that sums up so much. But some didn't care. You know, this, the, the picture is a lot more nuanced than we might imagine, I think. That's a wonderful answer. And of course, there's so many complications in this story. Before I go to the next question, I just want to mention that Emily has just said, tax the rich. So, um, you know, we have feelings that have never changed. Um, Ruth wants to know, of the homes purchased by rock and rollers, what is your favorite and why? Well, this is difficult. This is difficult. Um, I have a soft spot for Friar Park, which I should say I've never been inside because is that the, the Harrisons, George and his, his widow, uh, George and his wife, were very, um, uh, kind of the, uh, his last wife, were very uh, private. But it, it is a leviathan of a country house. Uh, and there were, there were, I mean, some of these kind of underground lakes and grottos, which were, were, were like kind of mad Ludwig of Bavaria. <laughs> they're, they're, they're filled with, with kind of glass globes and... and, and mm -hmm. And little kind of goblins, and I mean, you know, I mean, George liked to drop acid every now and then. And Shocking. These places were enough enough to put him off that for life. That <laughs> is, in fact, actually, I should say that that is why he took Friar Park. He lived in a house in Surrey, I think, next to a big girls' school, and he used to take LSD and wander into the grounds of this girls' school. 
<laughs> oh my god! I know. <laughs> Jeez, so Louise. They kept throwing him out, and he said, "I only want to look at the trees. I only want to look at the trees." And he, was, and he got so fed up with this that he bought his own stately home in his own ground. <laughs> um. Carol Don't asks. Try this at home, boys and girls. <laughs> well, well, if you have enough money, you can try anything. Um, Carol, Carol wants to know: Were rock and movie stars who bought these houses interested in conserving them, or did they just redo them and redecorate them to their taste, and then show off to their their friends their big houses? It varied, I think. Um, it, it varied. Certainly, um, somewhere like Getting um, Getting Hall, the Bill Wyman's house, is you know. He's conserved that. He's cared for it. And Jimmy Page at at you know, the Tower House, with William Burgess's Tower House. That's a museum. I mean, that well, it's not a museum. It's a, ha a home, but it's filled with museum quality furniture. I mean, it's absolutely. Can wonderful. you get access to that house? No, no. I didn't no, think so. No, I've never. He's 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 very private, sadly. But if anyone can get access, now while we're here, anyone can get access. Take me, will you? Take me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one wonders when this situation happens, when someone becomes such an important collector and preserves a house like that, what will happen when he leaves this earth? Yeah, will know. will he have the foresight to leave it to the National Trust or an independent private foundation that he's founded? Because it would be a shame not just to lose the sense of this house, but I think what's most interesting about him is that Almost uniquely among the houses you talked about, he's recreated the original interiors, which is a very, not just expensive, but very time consuming to research what was there. I mean, he's lucky in the fact that he has a 19th century house and not a 16th century one, but still, that's that's a big thing. And it would be a shame to lose all that accumulated knowledge that he's put together there. Absolutely right. I mean, I think when it comes to, I mean, to, to go back to that, that question, when it comes to sort of conserving these houses, you know, most rock stars, like most people, don't want to live in a museum. Jimmy Page is an exception, I think. You know, you buy an historic house, but you do stuff to it. You know, um, there, there are a lot of country houses sold and bought in the 1920s and 30s, where their new owners would, you know, not walls through, they would refurnish in their own style because they didn't want to live in a museum. That doesn't mean they didn't care about the house, but it is a home, first and foremost, you know, and, and an historic setting second, I think. You know, it's not like a, I don't know, not like a Waddesdon or a Biltmore or whatever, you know, it, it's 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 a place to live in, a place to, have, to, to party in, a place to enjoy. And most you know, of it's not. I think that's absolutely true. And we also know from studies done by the National Trust uh, to visitors to their properties that the, um, the the people who visit find the houses that resonate the most with them are the houses where the original family is still in residence. And there's evidence of um, bits and pieces, a television set in a grand room that, that someone's living here. And I think that this is something that comes about over and over again. Grand places are wonderful. But what we all want is a human connection, a way that we feel as though we can relate to something and feel comfortable. Because you know what, what I I don't think anybody wants is what I call the Blenheim effect. Nobody wants to live in Blenheim Palace. I mean, it's it's this horrendously cold and unwelcoming, incredibly impressive. But do you want to live there? No. And and I think that that adaptation is so important because at the end of the day, hopefully we're all humans. Um, um, and anonymous attendee wants. To, to ch check that brain of yours and say, doesn't Jane Seymour own a country house that you can go and stay in as a hotel? Yeah, I've stayed there. Have you really? Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us the name of it. It was Catherine's Court, if I remember right. It's in Catherine's Court. She doesn't own it anymore. Um, she used to rent it out, complete with the staff. Um, uh, you know, so you could actually, it wasn't a hotel. You could go and have the whole place. And there was a butler and a cook that went with it. It was That's always nice. It's yeah, always helpful. I, I, some friends of mine rented it, and I, I was lucky enough to stay with them. But I think the the idea of the the country house as a lived in place, you're quite right, Kurt. Absolutely right. But uh, savvy PR people quite got got wind of this quite early on. I mean, at, at Woburn Abbey, um, you know, you would see copies of magazines left lying around, or Country Life left lying around artfully. In in a um, a drawing room, the family didn't live in Woburn. They didn't live in Woburn. They, they lived in that place on the estate. Lord Bath didn't live at Longleat. He left Longleat in 1928. He never ever went back. He lived in a much more comfortable house called Job's Mill on the edge of the of the Longleat estate. Um, the um, 
the Devonshires didn't live in Chatsworth for the first 10 years, like nine years of, 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 of owning it. They lived in a much more comfortable house on the edge of the Chatsworth estate. Well, well, even though Robert has just volunteered to live at Blenheim, um, I think <laughs> I think what, what, what you're describing is um, some, something, as I think most of you know who are listening, um, I lead tours of these houses, and I would say 90% of the really grand houses um, the owners, if there are owners, as opposed to the National Trust owning the houses, all of them live in a smaller place on the estate because because it's a home. It's cozy. Nobody wants 30 foot ceilings. Um, not only is it incredibly expensive to heat, but it's just it's not welcoming. It's not a place you want to be. And it's funny because on the last night dinner of the tours that I lead, I always ask everybody to go around the table and share with the group their favorite house. And in 10 years of doing this, it's invariably the house that is the least impressive from an architectural standpoint or from an art collection standpoint. It's the house that I think, though people don't necessarily identify it this way, is the house that they could see themselves living in, that they would oh, want to live in. Absolutely right. Um, Smaller. Small, uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, and, and I'm sure in the back of people's minds, it's also what can I afford to maintain? I mean, you know, I tell that to people all the time, Americans who think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to live in High Clare Castle or Blenheim? It's like, it's a ball and chain yeah. of expense that you never, ever, ever get, get ever finish painting. It's like, the, it's like the Golden Gate Bridge. The minute you finish painting it, you have to go back to the start and do it all over again. Um, Emily asked that you mentioned the house in the style of Lutchens, and she'd like to know how the architect was misidentified and to try and get out that it wasn't Lutchens change the value. It was actually that's an interesting point because there are several there are several examples of country houses and I'm trying to think Dirk Bogard bought one after he moved from Drummer's Yard the house I was talking about and when they found it, it was Dirk it was on the market for, I can't remember the details but it's something like it was on the market for thirty thousand until they found Dirk Bogard wanted it then it was on the market for forty thousand uh, they just they, um, and this happened quite a lot when um, uh, but. The uh, Hurtwood Edge, the Eric Clapton house, it was said to have been designed, it's a, a kind of a big villa, it was said to have been designed by um, Lutchens, it was actually designed by Arthur Bolton, who was a, um, a writer for Country Life in the early part of the 20th century. The, the, the thing is that, you know, in those days, and we're talking, talking about the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, things weren't quite so scholarly, you know, it could be by Lutchens, just as, I mean, I've seen no end of adverts for a bird, uh, property advertisements for country houses by Christopher Wren. You know, the only design for it, and I've actually, I've actually got serious doubts over two of those. But, you know, if it's 17th century, it's good looking. If it's early 17th century, it's by Inigo Jones. If it's late 17th century, it's by Christopher Wren. <laughs> if it's got wood carving, it's by Grinnan Gibbons. Of course. You know, agents would just throw these things around. You know, they and they still do. You're quite, you still see them in ads. And I want to say for our, our listeners that, um, very few of there are very few Wren houses, <laughs> very few Inigo Jones houses, and very few houses have um, carving um, by Gibbons inside. But it's it's the default setting, and obviously, I think what someone who's trying to sell something wants to do is to hook people to something they can identify and say, "This looks like this. You'll love this." Um, Ruth asks if you can talk about women. So she says, we talk about the men who purchased these properties. Were there any women who undertook a purchase and preservation of a home in this time period? You know, that's interesting because I'm sure there were. And I'm, I'm trying to think now because I was looking in my research mainly at a rock and rollers, a rock and roll stars. They, you know, tend, those days it tended to be a male. Yeah, there's Janis Joplin. Yes, there's Carol King. You know, yeah, but but it tended to be a male thing. Um, you know, Yoko Ono is instrumental in in buying and living, obviously living in Tittenhurst Park with 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 John. Um, Patty Boyd redecorates Eric Clapton's house, Hertwood Lodge. Redecorates it. It's a you know, it's a it, it, she um, goes to America. She goes to California. She goes to sales, but you know, buying antiques. She sets up the house. What we don't we don't know so much about her, and that's true. I think. I don't know what you reckon, Kurt, but I think that's true generally about the country house. Because men tended to pay, we attribute the, we attribute the good works to them. You know, I mean, I, I'm I, as a good example of a house. It's nothing to do with rock stars, but um, Stan Den, 
uh, Philip Webb House in yes. the south, a beautiful arts and crafts house in the south, south of England. Um, and that was bought by, it was designed for a solicitor called um, Jonathan Beale, J.S. Beale. But Margaret Beale, his wife, is the one who decorated it. She's the one who bought in the Morris & Co. fabrics and, and textiles. She's the one who has the eye. But she she gets forgotten because he pays the bills. And it's a really it's a really good point. I think there's a lot more work to be done on this, a lot more work to be done on the role of women in the decoration and the, well, the role of women in everything. And I think what we're yeah, seeing, sure. you, know, you and I have seen in the last 10 years, I'd say, in the field of um, British country house studies, an enormous number of women writing books and monograph on um, women and, and their roles, because as is always the case, the people in any society who dominate it are the ones who write the stories. And um, I remember it wasn't that long ago, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years, it came out that William Morris's daughter had been a, a major designer. Right, of, yeah. of, and and he never acknowledged her. No one ever acknowledged her. Um, and that's the other thing. Um, you know, male egos are so fragile. God forbid somebody else could do something that you couldn't claim credit for. And it's even worse, it's a woman, even if it's your own daughter. Um, the last thing I'm going to say go. before before we go is I'm going to acknowledge that Tindy has said that Radiohead recorded their album, which I, I believe is called OK Computer, in Jane Seymour's house. Oh, in, wow. In case you didn't know that. A, a little bit of wisdom I'm, there. I'm off to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, really? thank you very much, anonymous attendee. That is all the time we have for questions. If you have other questions, you can contact us at any time at heritagetours at nehgs.org. Email us stuff. We can forward on your questions to Adrian. Thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. Stay safe, stay healthy. I hope to see you again soon on our online programs. Goodbye for now.